All right, well, everyone, hi, and welcome to Association Chat. This is your online discussion for the association community where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with topics of the day, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the association community. I'm the host of Association Chat, Kiki Latalian, and today we are talking about hoping for the best and planning for the worst, which unfortunately a lot of us know so, so well. Um, we are talking about this with someone who does exactly that for a living, the author, the speaker, the actor, Max Brooks. And before we get too far along with this, I want to give a quick shout out to Mike D'Andrea of Greater Talent for connecting me with Max. Mike, you are absolutely amazing. Now, okay, Max, Max is kind of amazing. You may be familiar with his books, books like The Zombie Survival Guide, World War Z, uh, the graphic novel, The Harlem Hellfighters. And his latest book, his latest book that just came out last Thursday, Devolution, Devolution. But did you know that Max is also a lecturer at the Modern War Institute at West Point? and the Atlantic Council's Brent Snowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. He regularly explores new ways to attack large concerns, which is a valuable exercise when we're all in the midst of a global health crisis. So he's here with us today to do just that, and I have him hiding, but he's gonna come out of hiding right now. And so welcome, Max, to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kiki. It's a pleasure to be talking to everybody. Yeah, so I'm I'm super excited to have you here. And I have to admit, I've been going, I just got the book uh, over the weekend. And I also bought the, the audio book, which is amazing. It's so good. And I am about halfway through. So don't, you know, no one tell me the ending of it if you're already there. But, you know, it's absolutely um, mind boggling that this book came out at a time when, um, you know, the characters are going through this, this accounting for food and what do we have and what's going on at one point in the book. And I think, I feel like I've just been through that. Like, I feel like I've just been through this. What do I have in my cupboard and, and how much toilet paper do we have and, and questions like that. So, Tell me, talk to me about the timing of this book. How insane is it? Well, you know, uh, unfortunately, the, the notion of being caught unprepared is nothing new. Yeah, uh, right. Th th this is not the first time in human history that uh, a society was not expecting something when they should have been. Uh, and that's what I study. All my work, be it uh, zombies, this one is about Sasquatch, or uh, World War I, true mm -hmm. life historical uh, novel, or even Minecraft. I wrote the, uh, anyone who has a child, the child's probably played Minecraft. And I wrote the first ever Minecraft official uh, book, but it really is just about people and systems and organizations who suddenly crash into change. Mm -hmm. And they are, they are presented with a choice, a fork in a road. Do they hold on for dear life to the old ways that were so comforting uh, and then perish? Or do they dig into themselves and find new skills and make new tools and reinvent themselves and not only survive, but flourish? And that is the theme in everything I write. Yep. And it's the basis of all my research, all my government think tank work. And strangely enough, you might think that it's probably something that would drive you crazy but it actually makes me sane because it makes me realize how possible it is to adapt to change. I totally believe that. I totally believe that. Oh, and there are so many people who are <clears throat> commenting. Liz says, love that, crash into change. We have destroyed the staircases and uh, so many brilliant moments in World War Z. Yeah. Um, you. you know, that's the thing is that as, I, as I'm growing, we talked last night, 
we we had a little chat about how this interview was going to go and we talked about gardening and yeah. you know it's like as i see celery growing and things i've never really been much of a gardener before at least not with vegetable gardening and i feel more in control of my destiny as i as i do this sort of thing talk to me about how <clears throat> well prepared you were with your own household as uh, the novel coronavirus took effect. The World Health Organization says on, on the evening of March 12th, you know, it, it's an official pandemic, uh, shelter in place, right? And I'm guessing that Max Brooks was prepared, but like, talk to me about that. All right, <clears throat> I, I would love to say that I was completely <laughs> prepared. I would love to say that I had it taken care of, that when the rain started, I already had my animals two by two on the <laughs> ark. And I was like, ha ha, is better learn to swim. Right. I will say that I was almost there, but there were some huge gaps that were right in front of my face. Um, and husbands, you know what I'm talking about. One of the things I failed to do was talk to my wife <laughs> because I was ready. I mean, I, I knew months before any of you knew this thing was coming. Uh, I got an email or a text from an old friend of mine who used to be the president of the United States Naval War College, Admiral Wisecup, who brought me into the military initially uh, with my books. And he said, hey, do you hear what's going on in, in Wuhan? And I did, and I researched, and I thought, oh my God, this is coming. This yeah. is coming. So yeah. I went out there and I stocked up. I was prepared 24 hours before the lockdown, 24 hours, I said to my wife, we're ready. Look at this. I have all these rice and beans. And my <laughs> wife said, I don't, I don't like rice and I don't eat beans. Yes. How do you not know that? <laughs> We've been together 23 years. How do you know I don't eat this stuff? Right, right. And then she said, well, I, I, you know I like to eat a, a bunch of leafy greens. Don't you know that? So I'm going to go to Whole Foods and get the leafy greens. And I went, no! So yeah. 24 hours before the pandemic, there I was, Mr. Survival Guy, scrambling. So I had to I had to get up first thing in the morning and drive. By the way, I drove right past the grocery store, the supermarket, <laughs> where the line was around the block and people were all right. coughing on each other. Yes. And I drove to the gardening store where there was nobody. And I said, just give me what you give me all the leafy green seedlings. What lettuce and and kale and chard and spinach? I'll take them all. Yes. And I was struggling to put them in the garden in that one day. And sure enough we've been living on it ever since. Right, right. Well, that's so good though. I mean, and the good thing about lettuce, I'll say this, is that it grows pretty fast, you know? Who knew? And different varieties grow faster than others. These are things I didn't know and well, like pre-COVID-19. And you know, when it comes to survival, there you have to think practical survival. This is one of my problems uh, initially is I was always sort of prepared for an earthquake in which right. you need everything. <clears throat> Forgetting that in a pandemic, the lights are on, the water's running, the freezer still works, so you can store meat. Uh, yeah. And also when I when you garden, I realized, okay, now wait a minute, let's just think about this. What can we order food-wise, delivery-wise, that can either be scrubbed in the sink or peeled or yes. microwaved to disinfect? And that's why I did all leafy greens, because those are that's the one thing that it you can't. You can't that's gotta that. come from the garden. So thank God I didn't panic and plant a field of wheat. <laughs> That's so true. It's so true. Well, you know, you bring up earthquakes and as it, I don't know if everyone's been tuned in, but you know, there was just a, a large earthquake in Mexico, 7.4 magnitude, horrific, you know, um, and I'm sure we're going to be hearing more about that. Um, but you know, you're right. We, we know that these things can happen. We know that, uh, I, I mean, what I, what I think is interesting with your books is that, you know, at least with, with the de devolution, I'll say that it starts off with a natural disaster, right? And it then it becomes off. something else. Yes, and it, it starts off with the eruption of Mount Rainier. Right. And so as we look at these things, we discover that it's not just it's not just preparing for making sure that you have the the rice and the beans and things like that but it's also you know situational awareness who's around you and and those things um and i do have to say that there is something cathartic and kind of therapeutic for me as i am going through this book and i'm like <gasps> that panic right and then suddenly uh, you know 
I'm not making those mistakes. Maybe I'm going to be okay. Yeah. So do you get a lot of, of, I don't know, free stuff or people from the prepper community that are like, please, 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 you know, talk to me about root cellars or talk to me about bomb shelters or talk to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The, the prepper community, what I try to do, and I get a lot of pushback is I try to infuse common sense into the prepper community. What exactly are you preparing for? Right. It's like when people ask me, you know, what do I need in my kit? What do I need in my emergency supply kit? I say, well, a lot of it has to do with where are you on this continent called North America? If you live in a, the desert states, uh, like Southern California, water is your number one priority. So you either, you number one, need a way to store water, but most importantly, you need a way to purify water because you yeah. may find a source that's going to be dangerous and you got to purify it. But if you lived in a place like Washington state where it's just falling from the sky constantly, that is your priority is how to stay warm and dry. So yeah. you've got to tailor make it to where you are and what is your present situation. So, you know, I, uh, I, I feel like there are a million questions I could ask you, but one of one of the main things that I know that this particular audience is interested in hearing about is about how to lead in times of crisis. Yes. You know, a lot of us work with organizations where we're in a role to serve. If we're not at the the CEO, executive director level, we're at least responsible for communities that that you know, are parts of different types of, of industries and professions. And there are a lot of emotions when people are yeah. going through a time of crisis. And so what have you learned from all of this <clears throat> research and going back through history, looking at what works and what doesn't work? Oh yeah, no, I, I can tell you this. I can tell you that the study of change and the study of adaptation is also the study of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And while we don't like to admit it, sometimes that change can be a blessing in disguise. So I, I do a lot of work uh, with the military and for them. And I can tell you the United States Navy's greatest moment ever was the day after Pearl Harbor. And it was a horrible thing. And it was terrible what happened to all those sailors. But the United States Navy pivoted overnight because right up until on December 6th, 1941, naval doctrine was about battleships, mm -hmm. big boats with big guns and a lot of armor. And that was it. And that was that was naval construction. That was naval culture. And this is what we do in the aircraft carrier was just about sending planes to scout out for the fleet and submarines. Nobody really knew what to do with. But suddenly Pearl Harbor happens. All the battleships are sunk in a few hours and all the Navy's left with are aircraft carriers and submarines. Mm. And the Navy pivoted so quickly and so brilliantly that those are the two pillars of U.S. naval doctrine to this day. That's how quickly the Navy adapted. And you see it in businesses. How yeah. quickly do they adapt to something? Uh, you know, St. Jude's is a great example because St. Jude's was tuberculosis. That's what they specialized in, tuberculosis. I did not realize that. Yeah, huh. yeah. I mean, a hundred years ago, when you said the word, when you said St. Jude's, that's right. what people thought. Right. That was, that was their brand. That was their, their talent pool. Boom. But then, and, and they needed it. Believe me, the man who the, I get my name from, my grandpa Max, died of tuberculosis when he was 30. So that was a big thing. But suddenly antibiotics come around. Boom. So instead of St. Jude saying, well, you know what? Our work here is done. Pack it all up, everybody go home. They said, well, what can we pivot to that still needs work? And that was cancer. Wow. So you saw okay. an organization that did a 180 and now continues to do vital necessary work and has now become synonymous. When you think St. Jude's, you think cancer. Mm-hmm. That is amazing. And it's a fascinating story about taking, uh, you know, they perfected what they were doing. We're so good at it that they're now like, okay, you know, what else, what other good thing can we do? And they're looking for how to defeat that problem. And I imagine that a lot of us out there, and I see a question over here, Heather, and I'm going to bring it up. Um, I imagine a lot of us out there are saying, well, we're really good at something like, 
oh, say having conferences and we can't have it right now. Right. What can we do to take these skills and do it in a different way? And in fact, Heather says, ask him what he thinks about conferences. Ha ha. Not until 2022. Oh, so yeah. what are you thinking about that? <clears throat> Listen, I, I, I can tell you that conferences is how I made my career. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. Because my first book, Zombie Survival Guide, came out and it was positioned completely wrong. Uh, they tried to position it as a comedy book. Huh. I, I'd been on SNL. I'd won an Emmy on SNL. Right, did, right. I didn't really win an Emmy. I was on the team. It's kind of like... <laughs> It's like my dad saying he won World War II because he happened to be in the army. No, but it's World nice, II. right? It's yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's how they tried to position it. Emmy Award winning writer for Saturday Night Live has come up with this outrageous zombie parody. <laughs> and you're like, that's not what this is. No. Right. Oh. So in order for me to completely change and market myself, I had to start going to Comic-Cons. Okay, and then. I, and that goes to my own personal adaptation because I am painfully, painfully dyslexic. Mm -hmm. So because I'm dyslexic and I can't read from a prepared text, I had to learn at an early age to be a really good public speaker. I had to speak naturally from the heart, off the cuff about something I'm passionate about. So that a weakness became a strength. So I would go to these cons and I could gather a room and I could make a fan base one handshake at a time. And now that's all gone. Yeah. So what do you do? Well, I just did a couple yes. days ago Wizard World, the big, the big Comic Con franchise. Yes. We, we just did our first online Wizard World. See, I saw some tweets about that and I thought, ooh, so what's going on? So talk to me about that. What happened with it? And what was the online experience like compared to compared well, to in, in I, person. I mean, I can tell you the online experience, it had its advantages and disadvantages. I was not expecting the advantages. Okay. Uh, because now the problem, when you go to a con, people are crammed in shoulder to shoulder and there's so much to look at that sometimes you don't get enough people to your space, yeah. to your talk, because they're, they're have to go to another talk or, you know, oh my, they're just tired or they just don't know they're overwhelmed. Whereas suddenly people could come to me and it's really been a boon, I can tell you, with uh, bookstore signings. Okay. Yeah, I bet. Because, I mean, they're right there. They can go and hear you talk and then get yes. several copies of the book, I imagine. Yes. And the physical space of the store is irrelevant. Right. You know, there's a, there's a little bookstore in L.A. called Book Soup. And I always launch my books there. And they're wonderful. But because they're a little bookstore... You, you cram 30 people in and that's it. You're done. You know, whereas this time I had 130 people. Yeah. So in that way, it turned out to be a, a good thing. You and know, oh, go ahead. Going. No, I was just going to say, you know, I've been hearing a lot of, of that kind of anecdote from association executives who have gone ahead and they've pivoted to, to virtual and they're saying we're reaching people we never could reach before. Um, the question is price point. The question is like, are we going to have the kind of profit margin that we used to? But it is exciting for a lot of people to see that they can reach these people that they couldn't before. And certainly the idea is that what else can we do? Like, you know, and, and I'm so glad you brought that up because <clears throat> that has to be the critical psychological step in adaptation. If you expect that your pivot is suddenly going to change everything overnight, then you're doomed to failure. Mm -hmm. uh, the Air Force has a wonderful expression, never fly the A model of anything. Because it is assumed when you have a brand new airplane, the first generation of it is gonna have a lot of problems. Yeah. So if you look at adaptation as a process, if you say, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna pivot and we're gonna try something new and we're gonna work out the bugs. And through that process, uh, new ideas are gonna come in. Mm -hmm. and we're going to build up and we're going to discover things we never even knew. Yeah. So if you look at it that way, then it's an amazing opportunity to really light the fires of imagination. I mean, you were telling me a story uh, about this last night. You were talking about how um, even for the audio book, there was, there was this, yes. you know, let's try something different. So talk to me about, about the audio book and how that all came to be. Well, that turned out to be a blessing in disguise. I mean, now yeah. for me, once again, personally, audio books are very important because of my dyslexia, I struggled in school. So my mother, who was the, the queen, the empress of adaptation, 
she took all my English class books that I had to read to the Braille Institute for the Blind and had them read onto audio cassette and then wow. brought them back to me so I could listen. So for me, that is a, a vital art form. Even now in, in my think tank work, I have to have the audio book and I have to have the print version that I underline. So whenever I do a book, I make sure we do not just an audio book, but a, a 1930s radio play. I and, love it. I love it too. Yeah, yes. It's got to be as good, if not better than the printed book. But this time we, we crashed into change because we mm -hmm. couldn't safely get the cast, including me in the studio. So Random House, God bless them. And this is a huge organization. I mean, Penguin Random House is part of something bigger and bigger. And I mean, it's massive. And yet they had the flexibility, the agility to suddenly say, all right, here's what we're going to do. We are going to mail out giant crates of sound equipment to every one of our cast members. And they did. We all look like domestic terrorists. <laughs> Huge <laughs> crates arrived. Yeah. And then by setting up uh, Zoom or FaceTime, the sound engineers were able to talk us through how to install the equipment. And then they literally were able to take control of our computers and record us. So it was yes. like there was somebody in the room. So they were able to use an existing technology, uh, you know, that we have now and an old fashioned technology, yeah. the mail. <laughs> and suddenly not only were we able to record the audiobook, we then now had a new marketing story that we could promote. So it turned out being better than it was because now we get to tell this story and people get excited. Well, this is actually, this is something, and, and Kevin has a funny uh, story here. He's like, neat. My mom actually dated Sasquatch for a while after she my dad moved up. I'm so sorry to hear that, Kevin. I hope therapy has helped you over the years. Sean says, I'd like to know what Max thinks about how things have played out for COVID-19. What surprised him and what does he see coming ahead? Um, yeah, this is, and, and Zachary, I see that you have a question too that plays right into that. Do you have suggestions for how to place reasonable limits on the necessary experiments of progress? Where do we set the boundaries for how far we are willing to stretch into new approaches and ideas? I, I agree. I think that's a, that's a great question. Let's talk about acceptable risk. Mm -hmm. Because the problem is when we talk about the process of adaptation under pressure, a uh, survival through adaptation, most of the time, it's not about creativity. It's about courage. It's about the ability to actually tighten your gut and take that first step and risk championing the new ideas. And I could say there's one industry that's in real trouble, and that's Hollywood. Because right. the problem with Hollywood is they used to make, most of their movies used to be what's called medium-sized budgeted movies, not little artsy films and not mega blockbusters. You always made a few of those, but most of them were just like middle movies, like Smokey and the Bandit. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a few stars, you get a few cars, you spend a few million, it makes you a few million, great. <laughs> right. Because you could do that, you could experiment. You could afford to make a couple movies that were bombs and maybe you got lucky and a couple were mega hits. But that was a wonderful laboratory, the medium-sized mm -hmm. movie. Now that's all gone. And it's either little teensy art films or it is these mega J.J. Abrams, Michael Bay, they call them tentpole films. And you screw up just once. Right. And then you're done. Can, you're done. You're done. That can, wow. that can bring down a studio. So you see the fear being baked into the process with that. And so when we're talking about change, you don't want to bet the farm. Yeah. You don't want to say, all right, listen, we're, we're, we're going to completely change overnight and we're going to take all our savings and all our capital and do it all. No, you, you put a toe in the water and you experiment, but if you, and that's why if you fail, you can afford to celebrate the courage behind the failure. And I don't know if that makes sense Yeah. Uh, you, because it's all about the culture. It's all about the people saying, uh, I, I don't want to take a risk on this because if I screw up, everyone's going to look at me and then I'm going to be seen as a better you than me guy. Right, right. Like, you don't want that. You want to celebrate courage. So in the military, if a guy jumps on a grenade and kills himself to save his buddies, people don't go, geez, sucker. They go, whoa, I'm going to remember his name for the rest of my life. Should be, it's, should be the same thing in business. Yeah. 
and this is this is how you build trust. You know, we were talking about yeah. trust and like trust is is just kind of falling apart everywhere you look. Oh. You look at institutions that we've had uh, trust in for the longest time. They're crumbling um, social contracts that we believe as a society we've set up. You know the trust in those crumbling, and yes, you know, we're we're at a point now where it's very hard to believe in in what somebody is telling you, whether it is the leader of an organization, an association, a company, a community. Yeah. Um, people are leery. They're concerned. They're weary of trying to figure out, you know, who they can trust, and you know, you you look at some of these ideas of establishing, oh, I guess, behaviors that are rewarded, you know, and that being a way where you can say, this is the type of behavior that's rewarded. This is the type of culture we have and purposefully moving right. forward, right? Right, right. And and so much of that is is how you look, how much you look at risk. Right. Uh, in the early uh, days of the Obama administration, there was a sort of a mini scandal because there was a company called Solyndra. And the Obama administration invested, I think, half a billion dollars to try to get this company going to, to bring solar energy to America. And it didn't work. Okay. And, and the media just dogpiled on him. Mm -hmm. And that could have been reversed if he had just said, yes, you take risks. And that's what you're supposed to do to do great things. And by the way, I would rather risk half a billion dollars to get us off oil, then spend a trillion dollars on a war for oil. Right. And that would have been simple. So you own the risk, you own the failure, and you say, great, I've learned, now let's move on. So yeah, so it seems when you when you just shared that, it reminded me of, you know, I'm sure a lot of us were listening and, and thinking, Ah, uh, where is the messaging? Why aren't they talking to you? Why couldn't the messaging work? And you had said something in an interview that I listened to about, um, and I'm sure I'm sure you've shared this a lot. That in your research, you talk about how in the past the government and Hollywood would work together to to create simple to understand, to take concepts that might be more difficult, and would work together to to create something that that would be a story people could grasp and and understand. But that's kind of dissolved over time, and and fa we've fallen away from that. Do you think that there is a way that that you know that could be revived? I, I, <laughs> Should I it think, be revived? Yes, I, I think there is. You talk about trust. The problem is. In the 1940s, during World War II, we trusted our government because also our government delivered. You know, that yeah. was, I don't know if you remember the movie, The Grapes of Wrath, these, these yes. poor Oki migrant farmers, and they get kicked around from one shantytown to another. And then they arrive at this amazing camp from the Department of Agriculture. Right. And the message is that there's something called the government. Why do mm -hmm. we believe in it? Why do we pay taxes for it? Why do we obey its laws? Because it gives us something. And in, and in the movie, it gave us something as simple as flushing toilets. Yeah. Physical. So we used to be good at that. And we've sort of lost our way where the, the, the powers that be have gone this way and we've gone this way. And we can get it back so easily uh, because America is the land of creativity and of talent. And all we need is for those storytellers to talk to the experts. And, and it's not, that's not just the 1940s. When I was a kid, you know, let's remember I'm 48. There was another plague when I came of age. Yeah. yeah. Called AIDS. Yeah. And our government was brilliant. They reached out to celebrities. Uh, everyone hearing me right now should YouTube a very young, very gorgeous, floppy banged Johnny Depp <laughs> uh, with C. Everett Coop with the Surgeon yeah. General. And he yeah. was like, Hi, Johnny Depp. I don't know much about AIDS, but here's someone who does. It's that simple. We can do this right now. We talk about how there was no plan for COVID-19, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there is. Here it is. It's called the National Recovery Framework. And if you try to teach it in a lecture, it's going to bore people to death. Why don't we do a schoolhouse rock? The National Recovery Response Framework, Fourth Edition, October two thousand nineteen, from Homeland Security. Oh yeah! 
<laughs> oh my God. I just about lost my ear, but I got so excited. It's so true. It's so true. And by the way, where did those even go? Like we should bring them back. We should totally bring them back. Oh It'd be God. amazing. It yes. Um, you know, actually Nick, and I don't want to completely just shift focus, but uh, I think this is a really great question. In an interview on NPR, Max talked about a mentor he had. What role does he see mentoring playing in the rapidly changing workforce? This is such a great question, that's, Nick. That's a great question. And strangely enough, that is the exact question that I tried to answer the last time I was speaking at uh, the United States Special Operations Command. Okay. We, had a, we had a big session of Green Berets, SEALs, Rangers, but also allies from 60 other countries. And it was a big tech conference. It was all mm -hmm. about sort of how technology is, is playing into global security. And the problem the military is having reaching out to the tech sector. And I said to them, listen, instead of trying to recruit people from the tech sector, you've got to recruit the recruiters because it goes to what Kiki, you said, it's about trust. Yeah. Because yeah. There are, the tech crowd is a very particular culture. And you come in with your high and tight haircut and your erect posture and your medals and you've just run like 10 miles that morning. <laughs> it's no, not going to fly? That's no, not going to? No. They don't know no? you. They don't trust you. <laughs> so you have to bake in the trust. Yeah. And I use the examples of uh, what was done in the 90s for LA street gangs. The community outreach was not some white guy, some white cop from Simi Valley. It was a former gang member that would mm -hmm. talk to these guys. So I said to the military, you've got to reach out and find maybe 10 of them, 10 techie guys who know what they're doing. Right. And then they right. go back and then they talk to their people and they say, look, you know me, you trust me. Trust me when I tell you we need to do some important work here. So yeah. I, think, I think now that we've balkanized and now that we're broken up into little cultural tribes, we need to acknowledge that and we need to reach out to those tribes. I, I mean, when we talk about mentoring, we were talking actually about how do we reach indigenous peoples around the world? Where do they get their media? Well, right. it doesn't matter where you are. Young people listen to YouTubers. So I said, look, when we're talking about promoting a vaccine for COVID, don't, don't have a big government official, have a YouTuber. You know, some hipster guy who opens boxes because, you know, these kids watch it. They open boxes. Oh, I know. Maybe, I know. You know yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Yeorg, and today we're going to open the box. And oh, look at that scene. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I'm also watching videos about how to grow potatoes in a container. So there we go. I, mm -hmm. I just want to say, Dan Sheeler says, is Mr. Brooks implying the government writing style is, shall we say, dry? I, I think maybe he's saying something like that. I don't know. We could oh, do have, a little bit better. I have a term for it. It's called printed ambient. Uh, yes. However, yes. I will tell you a story of one government agency that was so brilliant and so unexpected, <clears throat> the United States Marine Corps. This is how cool and agile they were. This was okay. their idea. Mm -hmm. They had a huge thick binder of emerging threats in 2015. Like, here's what's coming down the road in 2020 and 2030, and here's what we're going to have to face. Who's going to read that? Yeah. Young, young yeah. Marine officers, young boots. Nobody's going to read that. It's going to. So they came up with an idea of a short story workshop where they were going to take these facts, these trends, and put them into short stories. And uh, they had asked me to come in, and there was a huge conference. And they had Marines, soldiers, they had a Coastie come in. One Marine kid, he was 19 years old, a Lance Corporal doing base security in Cyprus, flew in on, I think it was an 18 hour pass. Wow. To help write a short story. And sure enough, we came out with a book of short stories that's really fun to read and yet educates people about the world we're going to be living in. See, I love that. I just think that that's so great. And I think that if we did more things like that, I mean, it's kind of like when you're, when you're, uh, learning, learning the faces of the terrorists that you're fighting, that they're on playing cards, right? You're like, you're incorporating that kind of, that learning into something that is easier to consume and easier to understand. I don't know if that was the perfect example, <laughs> but, no, but it's, it's an yeah. example of, of, you know, we, you don't have to be afraid of change. Yeah. And I think World War II is a great example because try buying an American car made during World War II. You can't, they right. didn't. Uh, I own 
I own a rifle, a bolt action Springfield 30-06 battle rifle that was made by the Smith Corona typewriter company. Oh, wow. Wow. Now, Smith Corona could have folded or they could have said, well, yeah. I mean, these people don't really need typewriters. So we're going to, we're going to lay off workers and we're just going to shrink. And instead they were like, oh, okay, well, we know that Remington has a typewriter division. Can we partner with you guys? Teach us how to do it and we'll retool. And there you go. Well, you did something else that I thought was really interesting that um, I, I think people can learn from, and it actually speaks to what we're talking about right here. And this is your this is your uh, Twitter account, and and everyone, if you want to go and follow, and and that is where you should reach out and tell him how fantastic you you are, Max. But if you go over there, you can see that pinned at the very top is this wonderful uh, video that you did with your father, right? And so the great Mel Brooks, and you did this, and you know, I, I think it's too small to really see, or maybe you can, like 16.2 million views at yeah. this point, but it's, which is crazy, amazing, wonderful. Um, but it's really all about why you should practice social distancing and, you know, uh, the different, it, it was funny, it was entertaining, but it was educational. It was something that you know people could understand. And you put faces, not just your your dad's face and your face, but you put you know the idea of of Carl Reiner and different like comedians in people's minds. Like you could be responsible for wiping out a whole generation of comedic geniuses. Yes, it was yes. funny, but it was also really. Uh, informational and, and educational for folks and probably did a whole lot more than just getting a pamphlet in the mail, you know? And that's what, that is always the goal is how, and that's why I write what I write about. Cause I, my books are all about really realistic, big, serious issues that we need to confront. But if right. I put it in a Ted talk, uh, you're going to put people to sleep. You're going to turn people off or you're going to scare them so bad that they're not going to want to deal with it. So you make it entertaining. Mm -hmm. Make it, make it interesting. I, I'm a horror novelist, but the video with my dad, I made funny. So they log on, they have a chuckle, but within that little short video, I had all the steps you need to do to properly socially distance. So there are ways yeah. and it's not impossible. Uh, Dan says, to be fair, we should give credit to the CDC for their infectious disease trading cards and their yes. zombie preparedness guide. Dan, I'm so glad you brought that up. I was just about to talk about this. I met the people who did this when I toured the CDC and it was a brilliant idea because it was trying to get people prepared for a genuine pandemic. And what the CDC mm -hmm. understood is that we all have what's called an ego defense mechanism. And the ego defense mechanism is the psychological version of the nerves in our body. And the reason we have nerves is to protect us from pain, right? Mm -hmm. you, you touch a hot flame, you go, ah, it's the same thing in your brain. If something is too scary in order not to be driven crazy by it, you go, uh, no, no, no. How do we get through that wall? Well, the CDC said, well, if we just do a zombie preparedness website, but we put in all the real lessons of a pandemic, then people will learn. And it was brilliant. And I wish it had continued to be funded. And mm -hmm. this goes directly to courage. Because here's the thing about creativity. And you, in all your lives, you know this, It you don't have to have a great idea. All you have to do is recognize a good idea and then stand with it. And one of the, the most important lectures I ever gave at West Point was about the man who invented the M1 carbine rifle that my father carried in World War II. He was a cop killing bootlegger named Marshall <laughs> Williams who drew the schematic in prison. And the warden saw him drawing this and the warden could have said, I'm burning that and I'm throwing you in the hole. Instead, mm -hmm. the warden said, I'm going to let you build a prototype of this rifle in the prison workshop. I mean, just stop right there. Can we yeah. imagine that even happening today? Like, really? Uh, I mean, the <laughs> courage. And, and he got yeah. in hot water because the I prison bet. board heard about this and hauled him up before them and said, What are you going to do if your prisoner escapes with the rifle that you have let him build? And you know what the warden said? I will finish out his sentence. Wow. He's the hero of the story because it's not about the person with the creative idea. It's about the people who have the courage to stick their neck out and champion that idea. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow, that is so amazing. Preet had said this earlier, failing isn't a crime, failing is how you learn and grow. People don't seem seem to think that way. And, you know, that courage that you have, whether it is to, because this guy could have put this thing together and it, it not work or, oh, it, you know, know. But the fact that it is that you have to have the courage to try and you can't be so afraid of failing that you don't ever take those those giant leaps to to make something happen. Yes. And and the greatest failure is in the stories of how we celebrate people who are successful. That is the great failure because we we tend to weave these yarns, which are totally false, that somehow great minds are inspired by God and then they tap them on the shoulder like right. an Amadeus and then they're off to the races. <laughs> and that is not how it happens at all. Every great inventor has had 90% of failures. Every great corporation has failed spectacularly. Every artist, oh my God. You know, my father is one of the greatest comedians in world history. Mm-hmm. And many of you listening to me love him and grew up with his movies. But growing up in his house, I watched that man crash and burn many, many times publicly. You know, yeah. my, my mother always had a joke, uh, you know, doctors, they just get to bury their mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only it were so yeah. easy, right? So the, oh, the, the ability to, so we must change the narrative. <laughs> we must celebrate, you know, yeah. The, yeah. The, the generation coming up behind us, these poor flightless birds called millennials who have been, their parents never taught them how to fail. Uh, They're going to inherit this country and they're going to be the future of the workforce. And we need to encourage them because they have this term epic fail. And they all attack each other on social media for their epic fails. That, that needs to be a badge of honor. Right. I didn't just fail. I failed epically. Oh yeah. And I'm still standing. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. I mean, for all of, for anybody who's worried about their careers right now, where things are going, there are a lot of event planners who who watch uh, association chat or listen to it. Listen, a lot of you I know are are curious about what the future holds for you. But listen, changing. I know we're so sick of the p word, the pivot word, but pivoting, changing, evolving, doing doing something different than what you used to do. We should not worry if the first thing that we try out of this doesn't work, right? Because because what? You know, we're just gonna yeah. keep trying and that courage will be rewarded eventually, you know. And I can tell you that what the military is trying to do now, because you want to talk about an organization that's big and bloated and is really paying a horrible price for not adapting. They had 20 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. And a lot of American soldiers died because they were learning too slow. So I can tell you that in the Modern War Institute, I've been able to go deep into military thought. And they're not just trying to be adaptive because to them, that means reactive. They don't want to just react. They want to be so agile that they can get ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. They want to build a culture that rewards creativity and flexibility that they can start to outthink uh, and outcreate the adversaries. And that should be the doctrine in the business world. Instead of, yeah. instead of just saying, oh God, this has changed. How do we react? We should be thinking, okay, how do we look at trends? How do we look at things that might happen? And how do we get ahead of it? Yeah. And how do we build a culture of risk that we are miles ahead of the competition by the time that change actually comes? You know, it makes me it makes me question where we are right now, because I know that, you know, this divisiveness that's been growing in the country, a lot of people who are arguing about ways that we could be doing things better than what we have been doing. It's really hard to say that we couldn't be doing better when you're seeing the rates of infection and all of this stuff increase, right? I mean, that plan existed before, we're obviously not really using it. So um, so I feel myself respond, you know, at a very, like at the DNA level, I feel my cells respond to what you're saying about, you know, creativity and having the courage and, and doing these new things and having that be rewarded And in my head is that story about, and we're Americans, right? And so we're supposed to be good at this creative stuff. This is supposed to be what we're good at. 
And yet we are daily, you know, looking at ways that we're not being courageous or that we're not uh, being creative. And what do you have to say about, and I know I'm putting you on the spot with this, but what do you have to say about um, a way forward? I mean, what, what do you think is a way that the United States can move forward in this where we are embracing creativity and courage? I can tell you that the way forward is, is studying the way back. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is exactly what you said. Every civilization right now, every country in this, in this world has cultural strengths and cultural weaknesses. America has more than its share of cultural weaknesses. But our greatest strength is our ability to reinvent ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's not just me pie in the sky. That is American history. Our last president could literally have been a slave of our first president. That's how right. much progress we've made. That's how much change we have made. And, and I talk to a lot of muckety mucks, a lot of PhDs, mm -hmm. a lot of TED talkers, a lot of smarty smarts. And I, <laughs> and I say to them, I challenge you, find me another culture in the history of the human race that has made this much social progress in this short of time. Yeah. None of them have an answer because yeah. that's us. That's who we are. Mm -hmm. We are not shackled by a thousand years of history. And believe me, I've lived and worked all around the world. There are some civilizations that are trapped by their history. Mm -hmm. Won't change because they haven't changed and that's not who we are. And that's not us. Our history is a history of changing. Yes, so yes. That makes us American. The ability to say, okay, this is how we used to do things. And they seemed as sacred as breathing. Mm -hmm. Now we've changed it. You know, and anyone who doubts that, I encourage you to go to what I call for me, my personal uh, shrine of change was the Excalibur Hotel in Vegas. <laughs> because I, I know it sounds weird. Stay with okay. me. I, I, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm holding on. Okay. So I had some friends <laughs> in Vegas and they said, hey, you know, bring, bring the kid and we'll go to Vegas all together. So we went and we went to Excalibur. And, and the moment I walked in, I smelled my childhood. Stale cigarettes. <laughs> right. Oh, my God. Which I have yeah. smelled for a long time. A longest of time. But there yeah. was time when I was young when everyone smoked. I and remember those days. Yeah. Right? It was in your clothes. It was in the air conditioning of your car. Yeah. There were ashtrays everywhere. Remember, kids yeah. in shop class would make an ashtray. Right. Their parents. That was who we were. Yeah. And now it's all gone. Yeah. Change. We did it. It's there possible. Was, yeah. It, in my short little lifetime, when I was a kid, there was no such thing called pollution. It was just you take a swig of beer while you're driving and you throw your can right of beer out. outside of your car. Yeah. That's what you did. When yeah. I was a kid, I couldn't, I live in LA. I couldn't see the mountains because the air quality was so bad. Right. When I was a kid and we had the AIDS epidemic, remember it was, it was free love. We were still yeah. living with the baby boomers who believed, oh, hey, what's your name? Oh, I don't know. Well, we just did it. <laughs> we changed that. Yeah. We yeah. Went from free love to safe sex because we had to do it. So if you're looking for a time when a whole country just like that adapts to change, look no farther than the United States of America. I mean, do you think the Black Lives Matter? You did Harlem, uh, the Harlem Hellfighters? Harlem yeah. Hellfighters? Is Harlem, that the Harlem Hellfighters. Okay, good. Harlem Hellfighters. And this Black Lives Matter, um, this moment seems so important because for the first time, you know, it's like these changes, sweeping changes around the country. And I know it's not enough yet. I know it's not enough, but I'm seeing things that we've been talking about for a really long time, Confederate statues and monuments oh, coming yeah. down and schools being renamed. And, and it just seems like, um, while that a branding being changed and it seems like while that stuff that has been talked about it's it's now that things are really happening and it's it's all at once it's like we hit this tipping point oh and yeah. that's encouraging oh it's uh, please the, the, the last few months i have seen 
so much reason to have hope in my yeah. country and in humanity. You know, when, when the protests started here in LA, uh, I saw an LAPD commander take a knee with the protesters. And then when he was asked by the, by the news why he did that, he said, I am the keeper of the peace. Mm -hmm. And my job in order to keep that peace is to do whatever I have to do. And if that mm -hmm. means taking a knee with the protesters, I will do that. When I was young, that would have been unheard of. When I was yeah. a kid, the LAPD had a very simple strategy, the Iron Fist. That was Chief Daryl Gates, and he was search and destroy. He was, it's us versus them, and you got to go in there and crack a few skulls to teach them by fear. And the whole city burned down. And within day three of the Rodney King riots, 55 Angelinos dead. Right. Not this time. Yeah, They've been peaceful. They've been organized. And even with the looting, mm -hmm. uh, people locked up their stores as opposed to when I was a kid and Korean Americans had to go on rooftops with rifles. So there's so much hope and there's been so much change and all of us have a choice. You either have to embrace it and live in it or mm -hmm. you try to fight it. And that goes directly to the Confederate monuments and that goes to the role of the storyteller. Because the truth is the Confederacy lost the war but won the peace. After the Civil War, the Confederacy spun this narrative, which was a lie, that somehow all of the South rose up together for the cause. Mm -hmm. Not true. In, mm -hmm. The Confederacy actually had to institute a draft before the Union because most people didn't want to fight. Most people, some poor Southern boy who couldn't afford shoes, he wouldn't get killed for you slave owners. The Confederacy mm -hmm. was the first to shoot deserters before the Union. The Confederacy used to have a phrase, rich man's war, poor man's fight. And if that were taught, then the people would cheer of all colors at those statues being ripped down. But we let the Confederacy, the Confederates, the losers, rewrite history. So now you have people seeing these statues of these rich slave owners who wouldn't spit at them thinking, oh, that's my heritage. I identify. So we need to... We, we need historians, we need storytellers, we need people to understand the future is not a scary thing. It's just another step. All right, so is, so is the next step for all of us in, in whatever role that we have to become those storytellers? I mean, what do we do next, Max? Well, I can tell you that, that we, we continue to embrace what we're good at. We, mm -hmm. we celebrate. America's greatest strength, mm -hmm. which is our ability to wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to be different. Yeah. And that could be our military. That could be our government by also voting to change our government. Because thank God people <laughs> before us have from Iwo Jima to Alabama have given us that right. Right. Uh, from or associations, from our mm -hmm. business world. That is the great future, is innovation and of change. And we've seen it. We've seen, back to what I said before about courage. We all need, you don't have to be a creative person. You need to find that courage. Think back to, if you could get into a time machine and be a fly on the wall at Kodak, who invented the digital camera. They had the brain power, mm -hmm. but the cowardice in that boardroom where nobody wanted to raise a hand and say, listen, I know we're, the film people, but technology is changing and we can either get ahead of it and dominate the market. So 10 years from now, when people think Kodak, they think digital cameras, or we can hang on for dear life uh, to our dinosaur living as the asteroid hits the planet. <laughs> and we know how that story went. And we know yes. how that story, do you want to be yes. St. Jude's or do you want to be Blockbuster? Right. Well, I have one one last question for you. And it's inspired by this interview that I saw. Uh, you did an interview May 13th of last year. And this interviewer from Eye on the Sun Valley, folks, if you want to go find mm. it, you can find that's the one. <clears throat> and she asked you what scares you. And your answer was willful ignorance. Do you remember yeah. this? Do you remember yeah. the? Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I write about it all the time. This so, is what I'm talking about. Sorry, go yeah. on. 
So I was going to say, I mean, you you've created your name in creating, you know, you've made your name in creating these real world solutions for things that can go wrong on a massive scale, things that you're afraid of. Have you found a solution for willful ignorance? I mean, yeah. is this still your major fear? Yes. <clears throat> The, this is exactly what I was saying. The cure for, because willful, willful ignorance is just a fancy way of saying cowardice. Mm -hmm. People who, who don't want to know something, they know it's out there, but they don't want to look at it. That's fear. So how do you do it? You change, like we said, a culture that rewards courage. Because this is important. And cultures that do that move forward. This is why we said in the military, they give you medals for courage. And they punish cowardice. There is no greater charge in the military than uh, cowardice under fire. Mm. Well, the business community needs to do that too. Cowardice under pressure. You caved. You stayed silent. You knew better. No. Whereas if someone takes a risk, they need to be rewarded. And all societies do. This is what we talked about yesterday, Kiki, is yeah. all societies pick their cultural values. Here's what's important to us. And then they build a system of rewards and punishments to reinforce those values. And you saw that even in our civil war, they used to draft guys from the same town and all send them into battle at the same time. So that way you couldn't desert because if you ran home, everybody would come home and know that you were a desert. <laughs> I know where you were, Ned. You were not out there exactly. with me. Right? I saw you the I saw the back <laughs> of you. So yeah. what we need to do is to build in systems of reward. And mm -hmm. the greatest example I can ever tell you about, <clears throat> I think, in fiction is a movie called Mr. Roberts with Henry Fonda. And Henry Fonda, they're on a ship in World War II, and they, the captain, James Cagney's horrible, and he has a, he has a potted plant that he loves more than the crew. And at one point, uh, Henry Fonda just snaps, and he grabs the palm tree and he throws it overboard. And the captain freaks out, but everything changes. And so the crew of the ship make him a medal called the Order of the Palm to reward him for taking that risk for them. And I think if every company now had that kind of a culture that said, hey, listen, you know, yeah, Darnell, stand up. You took a risk. It yeah. didn't work out. But I want everyone to look at him as an inspiration. Those are the companies. Those are the associations that will come out of this like the mammals did after the asteroid collision. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today, Max. This is, is absolutely amazing. We talked about so much. I just feel so inspired. I want the order of the palm in my <laughs> own life, everywhere I'm going. Um, folks, please buy this book, buy the, buy the audio book. I promise you, you will not regret it. Honestly, um, I, I listened to World War Z too. Both of those, both de Devolution and World War Z, I can personally say some of the best audio book books I've ever, ever heard. So really, really um, amazing. Max, thank you so much for joining me today. And thanks for joining Association Chat. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, I hope that you'll join us again. I hope so too. Thanks everybody. I know, I know you have a choice to watch anything from home. So I appreciate you taking the time to watch me for an hour. Take care, everybody. Be safe. All right. Okay. So thanks everyone. Please join us. If you really enjoyed this, let me know, like, and subscribe. Join us on Tuesday, July 14th, when we're going to talk with humorous journalist, author, and actor Mo Rocca about the role of humor during difficult times. Um, this was amazing. I am so thankful. So thankful to Mike D'Andrea. So thankful to Max for joining us today. And until next time, everyone, keep asking questions to learn every day. As Joseph Campbell once said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>